welcome to Playwrights Roundtable, a half hour of locally produced one-act plays by the organization of the same name, Playwrights Roundtable. And today I have Al Lit Her Asian, written by Larry Stallings. We'll have to tell you the twist behind the words after you watch the play. So sit back and relax and watch Al Lit Her Asian. world of weird and wacky wares. <laughs> I bet you've babbled that breezy banter to billions of bargain buyers. It's the mindless mantra of a flea market merchant. Your words work? Partially. Some people pause while passing to peruse <laughs> my appropriately priced possession. Shoppers stop to scrutinize your superb selection of stuff. Sure. <laughs> I should have supposed. Are you a frequent fleer? Oh, not normally. <laughs> my neighborhood is nearby North Noonan Lane, so is, is this your natural niche? Nestled next to the uh, knitting nook? Sometimes. So should I assist you in selecting something special, sir? Don't bother. I'll briefly browse your beautiful belongings. <laughs> Just junk. Frankly, your face feels familiar. Look, I have listened to lame lines like that all my life. No, I know, I know you. Are you native of Nebraska? Omaha? Oh my. Cross of the Carpenter Catholic College. Of course. Oh, we took trigonometry together, isn't it? Tilly Timberlake. You remember my moniker. I'm amazed. <laughs> my memory's malfunction. Is it Mari? Marcus? Malcolm. Al. Al Alexander. Al. Al! Al! Let me get a look at you, Al. You have a home or house here? Huh? Well, naturally, you're not in Nebraska now. I see what you're saying. The super strong snow and sleet situation unsettled us, so the siblings and I skedaddled. Say, hey, seems like your sister was at the same school as us. Sally. Yes, yeah, Sally. She's still a secretary. No, she sells seashells by the seashore. Huh. I should have surmised. What's your work? I protect the people. I impose the peace. My profession is policeman. A cop, a constable, a keeper of the calm. I, I can't conceive of you clamping cuffs on criminals to control and contain them. You were considered crazy in college, constantly called to the cloisters of the cross of the carpenter counselors. Well, my police profession is appropriate payback for prolonged periods of permanent partying. <laughs> I uh, have handcuffs here. Handcuffs? For pleasure, not perks. Perhaps I could persuade you to purchase a pair. Gracias, but I'd get them gratis. <laughs> Grant me the grace to ogle your gallery of gifts and goodies. Take your time. Hmm. Some strange stuff. <laughs> hmm. oh. This smells smoky. It incinerates incense. Incense? The stinky stuff some smokers use to obscure smoky smells on cigarette sets. It brings bonus benefits. A beautiful bouquet to brighten your bedroom or boudoir. A quaint container. Quite curious. Crafted in Cambodia on the continent of Asia. The cost is considerable. Can you come up with the cash to acquire this curio? I imagine that means mucho money is mandatory. I do desire dozens of dollars to deal and deliver this dandy doodad. My, my. My Asian. My apologies. My Asian is my name for my magnificent maker of marvelous aromas. You can pause the high pressure pitch. <laughs> I forget. You're a friend. Forgive my forceful fashion. I feel that fate foretells the finding of an affectionate family for this fine figurine. Family? Why family? <laughs> a woman's witty way of wondering whether you've wedded a wife. <laughs> so you're saying is a certain silky someone sharing my soul. Precisely. Part of my pitch for particulars pertaining to the possibility that you possess a partner. I apologize for probing and poking into the personal parts of your persona. I am just perfectly appalled by my pushy performance. Oh, no problem. So, spill it. Has some sexy seductress snared you? <laughs> Dee Dee, my ditzy darling, divorced me in December. Pardon my prying. I'm, I'm an impudent person, a premier putz, a perfect poop, a prize pinhead. And a cuckoo, queer coincidence, my also cuckoo companion had a comparable curio, a Cambodian container to cook clove incense. 
A criminal carried it from her current condo. Stolen! <clears throat> the same style. That's certainly strange. Say, it's been simply scintillating seeing you stop by my second-hand stall some Saturday when you can stay. I can continue the conversation currently. Crap. I I'm curious. Can I inquire how you acquired the container? My dear departed dad had it delivered from a Dover, Delaware department store decades ago. I think that's not thoroughly truthful. There's a thick thingy there that authenticates my feet. A thick thingy? A surface scratch. The same size and shape as the scrape found on the bottom of the smolderer. Stolen from a stand in her study, she said, and secretly smuggled into a silver Subaru standing in the streets of the Sunshine Shore section of the city! <sighs> I am insulted by your insensitive insinuation. I insist it's a separate incense incinerator. No, I know it's not another knickknack. I noticed in an instant it's the nipped one I denoted. Is it possible to provide proof positive to prop up the proclamation this is the purloined piece? Perhaps it's a replica. Not likely. I lit it for my loopy lady during lots of late nights of leisurely lovemaking. So it has special sentiment. Oh, lousy lackluster lovemaking. Look at the line I illustrated. She lobbed this, no, launched this at my lower limbs. It struck something. Oh, several somethings. The source of the scrape is still unsolved. Say, don't switch the subject. Sorry. Are you ready for a real revelation? I recognize a ring and a radio from the robbery of her residence resting right here. Really? I also see in your stall stacks of stuff stolen in separate assaults on several subdivisions. The sheriff sends out summaries of stolen assets every Saturday. The special sheets are saved and scrutinized at the 7th Street Station. You stop a second, Sam Spade. I had no sense the stuff I sell is stolen. Oh, poppycock! <laughs> How do you procure your product? From a friend of a friend. Oh, oh. Frankly, I find that offensive. Do you fancy I'm a frickin' fool, a fat-headed, flat-footed, foolish feather brain? The further facts are that Fred Pfeiffer, your friend and fellow felon, was found fleecing and fleeing a frat house Friday. A fearless feat which finished his felonious life. He fessed up and affirmed you fenced the folks' effects he frequently furnishes for you. No, oh, he burned your butt. He baked your behind. He braised your backside. He broiled your bottom. He baked your bum. Ah! He cooked your keister. Oh. He diced your deary. Ah. He fried your fanny. Oh. He fricasseed your foundation. He posted your posterior. Oh. Roasted your rump. Oh. Rotisserie your rear. Stewed your star and touched your tail. With these corny comments. I can't cope with these cute cliches. I'll come clean. I confess. Well, well that worrisome and witty wording always works wonders. I'm well aware I work with wares from wherever and you're prepared to pay the penalty for promoting pilfered products. Possibly, but perhaps a polite policeman, particularly a personal pal and possible companion, could permit this prickly problem to pass. Overlook the law. Well, isn't fingering Fred Pfeiffer sufficient? If Fred's filching is finished, my fencing is finished. Hmm. A compromise could be considered. If I conclude you'll close your cubicle and quit your criminal conduct. Consider it closed. Of course. There's a catch. Who's in you? I need the name of another nefarious felon of the night. A criminal? A cat burglar? A creeping crook? Definitely. Mm. During the divorce, Dee Dee decided to depart with dozens of my dearest DVDs, my DVD device, my Dolby, and my Dell to download additional dramas. Dang. Constant cajoling, crying, counseling, even caution of the courts can't convince her to quit keeping my collection and equipment. So, you're saying I suggest someone to skillfully steal the cinema and surround sound stuff your separated spouse selected? Sure. Hmm. I could contact criminal cohorts who could cause that to occur. Can we consider this the compromise for my collecting cash from clueless customers? Definitely. Dinner and drinks at my dwelling at dusk to designate it a done deal. Hmm, of course. Can I include the quaint Cambodian curio in case we're cooking? You can. Here's my current question. Your cuffs or mine? That was a twist. That was very clever. I enjoyed watching that. I've got a lot of questions for you. Not to mention we're going to break down the title, which if you haven't figured it out yet, well, it took me some time. But we'll tell you right after this brief intermission. Stay with us, and we're going to talk with Larry Stallings about his play, Alliteration.
Al. Al, Al, what are we gonna look at you, Al? Huh, you have a Homer house here? Huh? Well, naturally, you're not in Nebraska now. I see what you're saying. The super strong snow and sleet situation unsettled us, so the siblings and I skedaddled. Say, seems like your sister was at the same school as us. Sally. Yes, Sally. She's still a secretary. No, she sells seashells by the seashore. Huh. I should have surmised. You've just watched another quick clip from the play Al Lit Her Asian, a very clever twist on a play of words, lots of play of words, yes. <laughs> by writer-director Larry Stallings. But today, he's just coming in as the writer, yes. one of our Playwrights alums. It's great to have you here again. Great. Nice to be here. Now, of course, it took me a good 24 hours, but when I finally <laughs> figured it out, it was like a big, duh, Al Lit Her Asian. So tell me about the process of coming up with this play and the title. Well, uh, the way I came up with the play was that uh, I was writing another play, and in the process of the writing, somehow put together two or three words that started with the same letter. Didn't mean to, <laughs> it just did. And I wrote it, and I thought, oh, well, that's going to sound funny when the actors delivered that on stage, so I probably shouldn't do that. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I wonder if I could write a whole speech that way. And then, well, I wonder if I could write a whole play where each speech uh, would be, all start with the same letter, would be alliterative each time. I thought, well, this would be a wonderful challenge to see if I could do that and, and, uh, and write. And still tell a story <laughs> and come back to the end. <laughs> that's, that's right, exactly. So, but my friend, at that point, I wasn't even thinking of that. I'm thinking, well, I wonder if I could do that, if, if it would be possible, thinking of enough synonyms so that you could write a speech so that everything would start with the same letter, right, and still make some kind of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so I started to uh, put away the play I was working on, which, by the way, I've never finished, <laughs> and, and went, to, went to this one and started writing this way. Uh, then came the title, so I thought, well, what am I going to, uh, I had an idea of what I could do for the play, Kind of, but I didn't really, I, I knew it had to be very talky, it couldn't be a, an action play, it was mm -hmm. more talkative because it had to have a lot of words in it uh, that could start with the same letter. And uh, so I thought, well, uh, what can I name this play? And I thought, well, it's going to be a, a alliterative play and, uh, and have a lot of alliteration. I wish there was a way I could work that into the title. I, oh, <laughs> wait a minute, I can't. Alliteration sounds kind of like Al Lit Her Asian. Uh, well, that's what I'll name it. Okay, well, now, now I do have to write a plot around Al Lit Her Asian. I had an, an idea even before that that I would do a flea market scene mm -hmm. because I figured I could have a lot of items I could start them with the same letter, put them on the table and start them with the same letter and that would make the writing somewhat easier uh, for the alliterative process. And uh, so the flea market thing worked for this because I thought, okay, now I can write a plot so there's an Asian, something that'll be Asian on there, and but what can happen and then the rest of the plot came to me, right, what if she's selling wares that she's gotten illegally and a policeman is, is uh, checking her out. Uh, he knows that and comes to look at her wares and eventually arrest her for doing this. So, yeah, that's, it, was, it was kind of a roundabout process. Very much. You have props, you have language, you have to put all this together and tell a story. Right. How long did it take you to write that? Well, that was, the other, that was the other thing. About midway through this, I almost gave up on it. It took me about three times as long as, as normal to, to write a 10 minute play. And I was getting frustrated with it. And I actually put it aside for just a little while, not very long, for about a week. But then my mind kept racing and I kept thinking of alliterative lines I could use or two or three words I could string together in part of a, in part of a line. And, uh, and so I came back to it and said, okay, I've got to finish this. I've started it, it's a good idea. I think it'll be cute for people to see, and I've got to finish it, so I finally did. And this is completely backwards from the way I usually work. I almost always have the plot first, mm -hmm. and then work from that. And this is the one time that I started with a, an idea of, of the writing style, and then to the title, and then to the plot. So it was, uh, it was interesting for me, and, and, and I enjoyed it. Uh, by the time I finally got through with it, it wasn't, uh, I don't want to make it sound like a drudgery, because I really did enjoy mm -hmm. it. It was fun for me to try to think of different synonyms so everything would be alliterative. So I ended up being uh, very happy with it at the end. Crap. I I'm curious, can I inquire how you acquired the container? My dear departed dad had it delivered from a Dover, Delaware department store 
decades ago. I think that's not thoroughly truthful. There's a thick thingy there that authenticates my feet. A thick thingy? A surface scratch. The same size and shape as the scrape found on the bottom of the smolderer, stolen from a stand in her study, she said, and secretly smuggled into a silver Subaru standing in the streets of the Sunshine Shore section of the city! <sighs> Did you have any run-throughs with just your friends, your, your buddies, to just see if this just, would work first? Just, just my wife. Okay. <laughs> She's the guinea pig for all of my, <laughs> all of my shows, and we read it. And so, because I wanted to read it too. In fact, we read it both ways. She read uh, the male part first, mm -hmm. and then she, and then the female part. And I did vice versa. So, because I wanted to read all the words, so I could read everything aloud and and see how difficult it was. There were a couple of little really trip ups that were almost impossible to say. So I did change some words, still making it alliterative, but changed some words so the, they would be pronounceable together. And uh, but. We could do it, and my wife is is an, is an actress too, but not, uh, you know, she doesn't do a lot of a lot of acting. So, and she could say the words, and I could. So we thought, okay, we'll do it. Then the hard part was going to be the memorization of it. It's exactly. So PRT selected the play. Yeah, they did. And then selected two <laughs> great actors to to do this. I've seen them on on several other other playwrights uh, episodes and right. productions. So right. I know that they had fun <laughs> with this, but it had to have been a memorization challenge. Right. Uh, I suspect it was, and I had met with uh, Josh Baggett, the director, and I didn't direct this. Sometimes I direct my own, but I didn't this time. And, and uh, talked to, to Josh about it and said, "Yeah, I apologize to you." And to whatever actor ahead of time, you know, <laughs> yeah, ahead of time for this, but uh, uh, he was able to get uh, Ash, and I've worked with Ash before. In fact, Ash has directed me in a Playwrights Roundtable show that was a friend show a few years ago. Uh, but I didn't know Elizabeth, Alyssa. I didn't know her, uh, but uh, uh, she worked out to be very well. In fact, they, I thought they both worked well. I only went uh, uh, in the collaboration process for this was I pretty much let. Josh alone and let him go with it and uh, I did go to one rehearsal just to see how it was going and to make sure they could say the lines and they were doing great with it. This was like the second rehearsal and they were really doing well and uh, uh, so I said you're doing fine. I don't need to see anymore so I didn't see it again until tech till tech night and thought he did a good job and uh, that Ash and Alyssa both did a good job too with the words. Now, a lot of your plays often play on little twists. Uh, one of the most re recent ones was Harry and his condiment friends. So right. what kind of ideas do you look for when you're trying to come up with a, a one-act, quick 10-minute play? What are some of your inspirations? Well, uh, that's a good question, and they come from all different uh, places. Uh, you know, the alliteration was uh, different in that the style of the writing came up first and uh, uh, Harry and his condiment friends came from a cartoon I'd seen where they were talking about animals and uh, how uh, the different traits of an animal could be attributed to people too. So I thought, well, you could do that with anything and picked a condiment to do it. Uh, uh, some of my others, I, I have written another play that's been done uh, here, but we didn't film it, and it been done in New York, in Man Manhattan, called House Across the Street, where I'd seen a movie that uh, spurred me, and it was another one where the writing style was more, uh, got me started with it, and it's the, a man only speaks German and the woman only speaks French, mm -hmm. and they have a conversation, but they don't understand each other. But they're actually speaking in English for the terms of the play, so the audience hears both of their sides, but they don't know what each other is saying until a translator comes in. So that came from a from a movie. The very first play I wrote also came, uh, that which was just a foreign movie, and I thought at the time as I was watching it, what if I didn't have any subtitles? Would I understand what was going on? So that's that was the impetus for that. And another, my very first play I, I ever wrote. Uh, viewing Veronica was uh, based on just one That's little scene. That's an alliteration scene. right there. Oh, it was. It Veronica. was. About that. It was just. It was based on a, a movie that I saw. Just one little scene for a movie that I developed into a, a longer little, little play. You never know where they're going to where they're going to come from. Yeah, you never know. Now, playwrights has been around for how many years now? Oh gosh, I don't even know. I've been with them uh, five years. Uh, I think uh, ten or twelve. So you yeah. had a pretty good run with them. Uh, any other uh, recommendations or ideas that you would like to share with some of our budding writers in Central oh, Florida yes. who would want to get involved? Just yes. test the waters and see if they could be a playwright. Just do it. My first play, I'd never written anything 
before viewing Veronica. That was my first 10 minute play. I'd written, I'd dabbled in writing, but nothing really. And I just did it. I just thought, well, I'm, I'm going to have an idea. Let's see if I can do it. And it, it got accepted someplace. I thought, well, this is, this is great. Now, not that everything I've written has been accepted, but, <laughs> but that gave me the impetus to, to keep going. And you don't know whether you can do it or not until you do it. And so the best thing to do is just write, just, just do it. Just uh, don't try to edit yourself. Just go with what, what, what you're doing and see if, it, if they like it. The nice thing about Playwrights Roundtable is we will offer uh, feedback. So uh, we have uh, readings every month where people can bring their plays and read them and uh, we will offer feedback. Many times we say that is very good, very little needs to be done to that. Sometimes <laughs> we get some that say, well, that needs some work, here's some ideas, there's no conflict or the characters aren't uh, working right or we'll try to help. But always in a positive, uh, nurturing way, uh, not to be critical, to help the writer be the best writer they can be. Yeah, so it's a very good organization. It's a great process, and I yes. definitely enjoy your your plays. I think they're they're just funny and they're quick and they're witty. And uh, as always, it's wonderful to have you on the program. Thank you. I enjoy being here. And we'll see you again soon on another episode of Playwrights Roundtable. Until then, take care. Playwrights Roundtable provides opportunities for authors to have their work read by professional actors. Members of Playwrights Roundtable have seen their works go from cold readings to workshop productions and on to successful full productions. If you love the craft, Playwrights Roundtable is the place. For more information, contact Playwrights Roundtable at 407-788 8468 or check out the website www.playwrightsroundtable.org